Good evening, everyone. My name is Bianca Williams, and I welcome you to tonight's event, Change, How Artists Lead the Way. This event is part of our fall change series at the Graduate Center, um, where we are thinking about the social and political um, change of, of this historic moment. This is part of the Graduate Center's Promise and Perils of Democracy project supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Um, we have an exciting panel today. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have these artists and change makers um, who will be highlighting the special role of art in gen and artists in generating new modes of expression and reimagining the, a more just, equitable, and democratic world. Um, the artists tonight have taken political, act political action in a variety of ways, and we're thrilled to hear them talk about their work. The co-sponsors for tonight's event, event is the Center for the Humanities and the James Gallery. Our moderator tonight will be the fabulous Sarah Elizabeth Lewis, who is an author and associate professor in the Department of History and Architecture and the Department of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. She is the founder of the Vision and Justice Project, which has uh, spent uh, a lot of time over the past few years talking about representational justice and its role in affirming human dignity and the relationship between race, photography, and social justice. She is the inaugural Freedom Scholar of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, otherwise known as ASALA, and has a forthcoming anthology on the work of Carrie May Weems. Our next, our panel, our first panel tonight is Hang An Chuang, who uses photography, video, sound, and performance to create deeply introspective and reflexive and sometimes autobiographical art that examines histories of war and immigrant and refugee narratives. Hang An has had work at, at the MoMA, the National Museum, and the International Center for Photography. She's a beloved artist, um, a beloved activist in Durham, where I have had the chance of befriending her, and is a professor at the UNC at UNC Chapel Hill. Hank Willis Thomas is an award-winning Brooklyn-based conceptual artist who has done solo and collaborative work that has um, been exhibited all over the world, including Paris, the Netherlands, and Hong Kong. He examines themes related to identity, commodity. Um, media and popular culture, um, and the role that popular culture and visual culture play in perpetuating discrimination. Hank Willis Thomas oftentimes takes popular icons and imagery and turns them on their head. Um, his most recent uh, collaborations have been For Freedom, which uh, created pretty provocative, about 52 billboards throughout the 50 states in the US. You may have seen them and drove by them. Um, and also has co-created uh, the Wide Awakes, a collective that you may have seen marching in the streets just a couple of weeks ago in Manhattan. Um, and our last panelist is Vijay Gupta, citizen artist, acclaimed violinist, social justice activist, and genius certified by the MacArthur Genius Award emphasizing the role that music and art have to heal, inspire, and provoke change. VJ is the artistic director of Street Symphony, a nonprofit that teaches artistry for homeless and incarcerated communities. VJ teaches at Calborn School, at the Calborn School and the Longy School of Music, and has performed and is concert master in a variety of international sites. We are thrilled to have the speakers, artists, and panelists tonight. Please join me in welcoming them in your homes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bianca Williams, for that fantastic introduction. I'm really honored to be here with an extraordinary set of colleagues and friends and artists and all of you in the audience to speak about a topic that I know we care a great deal about and is really urgent to discuss today, the function and role of culture for social change and ultimately justice. I'd like to just offer a few sort of introductory remarks uh, and then ask the panelists each in succession to speak briefly about this topic. For me, this is a welcome panel discussion at this precipice moment in time. I think we're in a moment in our country that feels urgent and perilous as well, but the country has been in such moments before. This one has a distinct character. It offers near daily reminders of the fragility of rights in the United States 
hasn't been secured by norms and laws alone, but by regard, quite literally how we see each other and how we refuse to see each other. The violence of this lack of regard really falls into the blind spot of the constitution. And it's what the 14th amendment was meant to secure, but we know in fact, as the reckoning of our current moment has reminded us that this work ultimately is secured by culture. This is an old idea. You could even argue an ancient one, but the main thinker for this work really lived on American soil and his name was Frederick Douglass. He seized on the idea of the arts and culture as a way to advocate for an expanded notion of who belongs and who counts in society. He did this through focusing on the idea of picturing and photographs, but he too did speak about the importance of music for understanding our symphonic possibilities. He was a visionary in speaking about the idea of, as the speech was called in 1865, pictures and progress. And in that speech, he stated that it might take over 150 years for those of us to come along and better understand what he meant when he confused his audiences with this speech. And here we are in that long anticipated moment, in that long journey, in which he understood that the arts would play a crucial role in democracy and society. Finally, I would offer that a sort of submission or my own belief, which is that if we don't appreciate the arts as a mode of measuring human life, if we don't see the increasingly crucial function of visual literacy or cultural literacy for our own self-comprehension, I think it's because we're only forced to do so during times of crisis of the kind that we find ourselves in now. And so we have an opportunity to see past ourselves, to think through the function of arts and culture, I would say anew. This is what's inspired the Vision and Justice Project, but it's that project has been inspired by the panelists who I'm really honored to be joined with tonight. So tonight we're going to have a chance to reflect and meditate and interrogate this idea of the role of art and culture for justice ultimately. I'd like to ask that they each, each panelist offer just brief reflections on how their work participates and contributes and maybe even challenges this idea of this grand journey ultimately. And I'd like to begin, if, if that's all right, um, with Vijay Gupta. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Um, I feel so moved to think about that stark visage of Frederick Douglass, who was not only a visionary, but also a violinist. Yeah. And there are these amazing stories of Frederick Douglass playing a violin in the Scottish Highlands. And so, in fact, I'd like to start with just 30 seconds of a tune that I'm sure you'll all recognize. Um, and this is, this is by way of my introduction here. I'd like to start by quoting um, the wisdom of, of an incredible Aboriginal teacher named Lila Watson, a visual artist um, who comes from the Muri tradition. And she says, if you're here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you're here because your liberation is bound up in mine, then let's work together. And so in that way, I see collaboration, that deeply artistic ethos as co-liberation. And as an artist, the rooting of my work is to understand that the macrocosm of change that we wish to accomplish, that we wish to see in the world, starts with a daily creative practice. 
I am taught in my Hindu spiritual practice, that idea of regard, of seeing, that's literally what the word namaste means, right? It's, of course, been appropriated by yoga traditions, um, yoga practices, uh, but literally comes from saying that I see, I see you, I see the divinity in you manifested within myself. So whatever change we wish to manifest in the world must manifest through a daily commitment, uh, a practice within ourselves. Um, and in that way, our liberation is bound up in the liberation of, of identifying ourselves with a specific artistic intention. That intention of liberation uh, is found in deeply personal practice, but also in community. And so the work that I find myself thinking about more and more is who are my people? Who are my people? Um, I am of Indian descent. Uh, I grew up listening to Bengali folk songs and Sanskrit chanting and Hindi film songs, as well as my parents who were obsessed with Rod Stewart and Julio Iglesias. And I ended up playing Western classical violin. I went to school at Juilliard in New York, I went to school on the East Coast, played with orchestras. And I find myself aching um, to find what my own voice is, to find my community. And I find that intersection in making music in my little studio and in making music with a community. And the community with whom I make music are individuals affected by homelessness and incarceration. But I like to actually think about these individuals as communities in recovery and communities in reentry. We are all in recovery from something. We are all in reentry. And this kind of transitional position uh, I think is an incredible, important place for us to understand as being the key geography of the artist. So I'm going to pause there, but I find my identity in the in-betweens. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Hung An, would you go next? Thanks so much. Thanks. That was beautiful, um, DJ. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, CUNY, for inviting me on this panel. It's a huge honor to be here with you all. Um, I just want to mention I'm, I'm, I'm zooming in from Durham, North Carolina and speaking from the indigenous stolen lands of the Sacspaha, um, Shakori and Eno peoples. Um, as an artist, I think about change as being embodied and I think about this in two interconnected ways. First, I make visual work because I believe that political battles are ideological battles and visual ones and these battles can produce change. I've understood this since I was a child when I saw images of Vietnamese people being killed and experienced a kind of disembodiment, a kind of shock of recognition of the paradox that I could not reconcile. I am to be killed, I am to be saved. Um, in their powerful conversation last night, Angela Davis and Gina Dent spoke at UCSC on visualizing abolition and reminded us that experience alone does not liberate us, that simply seeing does not produce action or transformation. We understand this, of course, all too painfully as we see images of state sanctioned violence and murder of black people over and over again. So in my work, I consider the embodiment of experience in an interrogation of the tools and conventions of looking and hearing that are inextricable from a history of violence. So a question that I ask myself in my work is how, under what conditions and by whom does the racialized body, the gendered body, become legible when the history of the camera is an instrument itself of colonial aggression and violence. An embodiment remains critically relevant, relevant to ab abolition and to the movement to destroy racial capitalism because racial regimes depend on a spectrum of visibility that has been and still is bound up with the histories of photography and the camera as a weapon of colonialism, imperialism, empire, and policing. So the global economic systems um, representations and imaginings are ruled by racial capitalism and those who maintain it. I realize I need to share my screen to look at an image. Um, let me do that real quick. Is that, can everybody see that? Okay, cool. I threw this in, um, Sarah, because I thought I would just put it in there since we, we might talk about it. But this is an image from a project with actually my collaborator um, and dear friend Hung Ngo um, and I did. Um, it's called Invisibility it, the opposite of looking is not invisibility and the opposite of yellow is not gold. And maybe we'll talk about this in a little bit, but I'll just throw this up here to, to have as an image while I continue. 
Um, so I see my role as an artist in this struggle to engage in these questions of visibility by attempting to intervene upon the conventions of looking that typically shut down radical ways of seeing and trying to produce images that nurture ways of seeing that exceed the limits of the apparatus and open up possibilities for what I like to think of as intersubjective transformation and cultural shifts, a space for inter, inter vulnerability which is a term by Cindy Milstein, who, who wrote that in a book called um, Radical Morning. The image you're looking at, um, again, is from, um, from this installation, um, the opposite of looking is not invisibility. Um, this is an image from uh, an installation shot from a show that's currently up at the MCA in Chicago right now, curated by January Parkos Arnal and Lin Aichan called Alien versus Citizen. And also Hung Ngo and I also worked on this project it's called And 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 Stammering an Interview. It's an ongoing performance and installation that centers the, the interrogation for US citizenship to engage questions about immigration, exclusion, the performance of belonging, and the power of the state. Originally based on questions asked of Chinese immigrants on Angel Island and contemporary US citizenship questions, the recent iterations of the performance uses language from the 2017 executive order banning immigrants and refugees from seven majority Muslim countries and also 2020 executive orders around immigration and policing. So the project is inspired by techniques of um, um, theater of the oppressed by Brazilian act activist uh, Augusto Boal. Um, and in the performance, we randomly select an audience member to be interrogated and must sit through an interrogation in front of a public audience um, um, as if they were um, um, trying to apply for citizenship. So we've done this performance twice now at the MCA in the last two months. And of course it's over Zoom. So this is a screenshot from, from, a, te from a test. This was an, actually the, the real performance. I didn't get screenshots of that. Um, so the, the last thing, so that's the first thing, just sort of thinking about interventions in looking and trying to change, uh, uh, change the conditions under which we see um, and then secondly, just really quickly, I think about changes embodied as in when we practice radical ways of looking, our bodies must follow that radicality. We must act, we must be on the streets. This is also a visual and aesthetic experience that is transformative. Um, this is an image from when we pulled the Confederate statue down in Durham, North Carolina in 2017. Um, I became an artist after I was an arts educator and activist um, doing labor organizing and youth organizing around anti-war and anti-capitalism protests in the early 2000s. So as artists, I really feel strongly that we must hold ourselves accountable to the work that we make. Um, and of course, right now, as we all know, under these conditions right now, under a fascist administration and this slow degradation of our everyday realities, there's a kind of dual need to intervene upon the images and also be embodied in the street. Um, so, and I think artists are in a unique position to dismantle the institutions that need to be reimagined and made anew because we both exist inside and outside. Um, I return again and again to Fred Moten and Stefano Harney's work and what they say about universities that the only possible relationship to the university today is a criminal one. Um, and we could say the same maybe of art institutions. So I have a lot more to say about that, but I will end with this image. This is the image of um, the night that we pulled down Silent Sam on UNC's campus where I also, where I teach. Wonderful. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Hank Willis Thomas, might you speak to us a bit with Zenzi there? Someone's uh, here to steal the show, uh, she's disappearing. So, uh-oh, there she is. There she's gone. There she is. There she's gone. <laughs> okay, Zaza. Can I, can I go to the talk now? You have to come in right now? Oh, now nice. she gives a kiss. <laughs> and done. That's good. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you can't beat the timer. <laughs> um, those are real pride. Those are real, real tears. I must be good. <laughs> um, so that was Enzali Ruth Hockley Thomas, the future of, of the world. Um, I'm sure many of us um, have connections with the future. Um, and I am Hank Willis Thomas, and I'm really grateful to be in the now, now, now with uh, all of you. I am humbled and honored to be sharing a panel with you all. Um, who do such incredible and deep work um, spanning 
space and time um, and function as alchemists in your varied ways of storytelling. And I just have one request of BJ and Hunan, which are, can you type some of the names that you wrote? You said you mentioned in the chat, so I could not be like trying to remember. <laughs> like, where's the footnotes? <laughs> um, I got you. I've got notes I'm all written uh, here. Yeah. All right. Well, the professor would. Um, so I guess really briefly, because uh, Zenzi took up some of my time, I'm going to just talk about um, two things. One, which is uh, the 13th Amendment. Neither, which which says in section one, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime, whereof the parties shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section two, Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Get it? Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So if you were wondering about how we find emancipation finally in our country, we uh, it's pretty simple. We become the Congress that enforces these legislations through appropriate um, methods. Um, and I am part of many, 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 many collectives. Um, the two that I'm, I'm representing today are Four Freedoms and The Wide Awakes. They, we collaborated on this infinite playbook where we decided that we, to acknowledge that we are on an infinite emancipation march from 1862 infinity, that the work of uh, the abolitionists, which included the original Wide Awakes uh, and so many others is not complete and it may never be done. And that the idea that kind of true and ultimate salvation and, and liberation will happen for everyone in our lifetime is actually futile because if life was that simple, it wouldn't be worth living. And all of us in 2020 had a, a wake up call. We are the 2.0, 2.0 of ourselves and maybe further. Um, and it's time for an upgrade of the global operating system and uh, part of that it requires us to reconsider who we are and what we're doing in, in, in life and how we uh, take action. And so my collaborators, um, Michelle Wu, Eric Gottesman, Claudia Pena, Manushka McGlure, uh, and so many, many, many others, um, more than I can think of, <laughs> um, decided that we needed to like, if we're gonna like be playing this, we wanna, like, if we want to have fun and and actually make change, we're going to have to, you know, make it a game. And we were inspired by James Carson's notion of finite and infinite games, which uh, describes infinite ga finite games as games that come to an end when someone has won, and infinite games uh, being described as games which are played uh, with the objective of continuing to to stay in a state of play. And so we uh, realized if we're going to have playing a game we needed some rules <laughs> and we wrote uh these four rules we and others i'm sure because no one knows who does anything i know what, there's two lines i wrote so i'm going to ask each of us to read a rule uh i'm going to ask professor lewis to read rule number one of this infinite game with pleasure no one plays alone you know nothing you need to know the rules always change love over rules and BJ, rule number two. There are no gatekeepers. Bring people into play. Be where you are. Carry your own trash. I'll read rule number three. Learn from feeling. Let love quiet fear. Nourish joy. Go there. And hang on. Oh, you're, on, you're muted. You're just in time. Leap before you look. You know everything you need to know. Together we are awake. And seriously, don't take yourself too seriously. Play on player. And with these rules, uh, which of course recognize rule number one, being that the rules always change, we've been inviting more and more people into the state of play because the finite game of this election and who wins is important 
the, the infinite game of our life long generations long infinite work um cannot ever come to a, a halt and, and when we have that infinite vision it, it gives us greater perspective on what we're working towards and we were first inspired in four freedoms by norman rockwell fdr's uh four freedoms best illustrated by norman rockwell many think um and where he said that everyone was entitled to four basic freedoms freedom of speech freedom from worship freedom from fear and freedom from want and we decided that um by accident, actually, <laughs> when a, 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 a sign language interpreter asked us questions about our project, that we should have the new four freedoms, which are listening, healing, justice, and awakening. And that through uh, this process uh, that starts with deep listening, we can perhaps have awaken an awakening that leads us towards justice and hopefully results in healing. And because both within the individual bodies and in the body politic, these things are necessary constantly for a healthy community. And so if you go to fourfreedoms.org and you can download the infinite playbook and hopefully play along with us, um, we, it, by, which you actually already are if you're here. <laughs> and so we, we, we implore you to take these documents and, and make them your own, invite more people into play and, and make and, and elevate civic joy because we realize that this should be a festive season that we have to have. Well, you know, it's Oktoberfest in Germany. Why don't we have Oktoberfest here? Because we're actually planning and, and choosing our future right now. And that should not be something that we do with fear and anger. And so this is um, the, the intention of most of the work that I've been doing. And only this week did I realize that if all of us start actually running for office, that means there's a, that increases greatly the likelihood that creatives will be actually designing the laws that shape our future. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that as it applies to the 13th Amendment, you will probably be running for office someday soon. I love it. I am so just thrilled that we're all together here. I feel as, as though we have the spirit of Frederick Douglass with us as sort of invoked through Vijay Gupta's opening and through with the end of the presentations, uh, the wide awakes calling us back to this insurgent moment from the 1860s that we are in, in the thick of this infinite play <laughs> and this onward march. I, we have um, about 15 minutes for us to have a conversation. I had a number of questions sort of in mind, but as I hear you all speak in, in a, a chorus, I'm realizing what creates that through line um, one of the many threads is that of well, collective embodiment, this question of that you've asked really at the start, who are, who are my people, right? That you asked, PJ, you know, this is really a question that I hear you all answering in different ways. So the, the kind of traditional way of asking that pre-pandemic might have been, let, let's talk about civic engagement. How does the artist you know, provoke civic engagement? We're asking, I think, a, an even more probing question. Who are my people, right? And, and how can we reimagine society and what we even mean by civic engagement through that? So I wonder if you can reflect on how it is that your practice, or as, as you might put it, BJ, your daily practice, right, allows us to think about this question: who are who are my people in in unique ways? And if you might take that um, question with respect to a particular project, I think it would be great for, for the audience. You know, one image that flashes in my mind immediately is that of the sacred tree. There's so many sacred trees and so many traditions. And in my Hindu tradition, it's, it's actually a fig tree. It's an Ashvatha tree. But the tree is upside down. The roots are in the sky and the fruits are in the earth. Huh. Um, and so what I immediately am thinking of when I ask that question, who are my people? The question that I'm asking is to whom am I connected? What are the connections? What are the gifts that I'm willing to manifest from within myself, the fruits that I'm willing to bring out into the world and give? But what am I also willing to receive? What is that communion? Where do you find yourself called into communion? 
right? And if that sounds like church or sacred language, that's on purpose, right? I mean, what we do is deeply sacred. And, and, and what I've been thinking of more and more is this idea, again, in, in, in the tradition from which I come, is, is the idea of sadhana. Sadhana is this idea of daily practice. What is your creative sadhana? Um, and so one project that um, my organization, Street Symphony, is part of is a weekly process group called Music for Change. And it's a gathering of individuals who are in reentry from uh, very long, often decades long sentences in any one of the 35 California state prisons. I work in a community known as Skid Row. Skid Row is often a community thought of as urban blight, a place to be erased, but I have come to understand that Skid Row is the largest recovery community in America today. Uh, this project is, um, it takes place at a place called the Weingart Center, which is the one of the key providers of reentry services in Skid Row. And our work is about manifesting love in a space. We've done so much strategic languaging around what are the metrics? How do you measure this? How do you figure out what's going on? And truly, I am understanding that I come to Skid Row, I come into that space as a place of my own pilgrimage. I come with the broken shards of myself, realizing that there's no one part of myself I can throw away. And if that's true, then I have to lean into what aches the most. Right? So I think as artists, we're constantly tracking the parts of ourselves that are the most fragile and most vulnerable because those are the nodes of connection. Right? And so you know, there is a very fine line. Um, you know, Hank has, has taught us so beautifully about this you know, de decommodifying art. We have to think about the verb of art and not the noun of art. And the verb of art is to connect. Right, And so when we think about reclaiming these shards of ourselves, we need to understand that those shards are mirrors. Right, They are the same in you as they are in me. So as we fish for those shards in each other, we recover those parts of ourselves. And that, for me, happens in circle, in dialogue with individuals who are re-entering society after decades-long uh, sentences of incarceration. Right. Mm -hmm. And so often these individuals are my teachers because they have had to develop a spiritual creative practice in order to survive. So for them, art making is not entertainment. It's a lifeline. It's a lifeline. It is a spiritual, real lifeline. Um, and so that is a kind of nourishment and replenishment of realizing who my people are. So I'm going to pause there. Thank you. Hank or Kulam? I'll jump in. Um, I'll just kind of tag on to what Vijay said because I think just like the last thing that he said in terms of the lifeline of art and just like what it gives. I mean, as I mentioned from the beginning, like art really saved me, you know? It was a way of intervening upon the stories that were not visible um, that I wanted to see about my own history and about my own experiences and the um you know the violences that i saw being done to my people and the that absence you know and so it was an intervention as a lifeline for me to be able to assert myself you know um into these master narratives that perpetuate these cancerous myths of nativism and and create these narratives around who can belong and who can't belong um so I think for me and my work, I mean, there's a lot of ways to think about um, about um, who are my people. It's such a great way to think about it, because again, I think about you know as I you know as I said that I kind of think about it in the ways of just like my work, sort of doing the kind of discursive cultural work, and then I do also think about really anchoring that work that compel that work compels me to be engaged in where I am and looking to the community that I live in to create that community and to build and, and, and um, you know, provide the ways for other people in my community to be engaged in, in the um, actions that are really important to where we are right now, right? Um, so I just think about, you know, like my, the project that I mentioned, Invisibility, um, the opposite of, not, of looking at invisibility, where I, I really pay, try to pay attention to like, a, a, where is the viewer coming from? And I, I hope in my work to try to really address like the, the where they're coming from and how they're looking and try to create this space 
where there's a connection, right? And sometimes it's a, dif it's a difficult place. Um, it's a difficult place because I'm not you and you're not me and I'm, you're not gonna understand where I'm coming from. So there's this really difficult space where I think there needs to be this recognition of that difference and perhaps some discomfort in the thing that you don't know, some discomfort in the thing that you actually feel uncomfortable even having an emotional response. How am I supposed to feel about this? So in my work, I really pay attention to the audiences like Asian American young people and Vietnamese young people have a very emotional response to my work. And off sometimes my work has been illegible to people where I've had to really explain things in different ways because the histories are not known, they're not, you know, understood. So I really think about that really specific subjective experience that people are bringing to it. And I think oftentimes I'm making work for my people. I was just in graduate studios visits at Parsons and I said, you can make work for people you want to know about, you want to speak to. Who are you speaking to? You don't need to speak to the white institution that is determining what's valuable or what's legible. You know, don't think about what's legible to them. What is legible to the people you want to speak to? And I think when I learned that in graduate school myself, and I had that term where I was like, oh shit, they're not understanding anything I'm saying. I'm not using the language that they know at all. I cannot think about that, you know? And it, it was like this very freeing moment to just be like, I'm just speaking to my people, <laughs> you know, and those people will understand, <laughs> hopefully, you know? And of course it's formal and there's other things. Of course, there's a lot I had to learn as an artist to, to make that even legible to my people, right? Um, but in general, I think that was like a really important part of thinking about that collective, who am I speaking to, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, no, it, it's, so crucial what you describe here. I mean, the idea that you also began with as a reflection on Gina Dent and Angela Davis's conversation, that is the idea that simply seeing does not create change really speaks to the work of cultural workers and artists in shape shifting us so that we can imagine the we as who some others might consider to be the other, right? How is it that we can ask ourselves who are my people and see see the answer in anyone right this is much of the work that brings us to I mean, your collective practice hank you know with four freedoms and with the wide awakes it's I think gesturing towards new tactics to get us to understand the we anew can you talk to us a bit about the, the genesis of the Wide Awakes project in particular as it relates to that idea or others? Oh, you're, you're muted, I think. I said, so the Wide Awakes, for those of you who don't know, were uh, 19th century, uh, 1860 specifically, and almost only uh, abolitionist movement that sprouted up um, basically soon after the assassination of John Brown, after the raid on, on Harper's Ferry, on February 25th, 1860, when a um, rich white Southerner by the name of Cassius Marcellus Clay from Kentucky went to the uh, cotton um, manufacturing hub of the North Hartford, Connecticut to speak uh, against the horrors of slavery. And these six people, uh, shopkeepers, tailors, uh, uh, decided that they needed to protect abolitionists. And they uh, put, they decided they were gonna carry torches to, to walk by night and wear cloaks so the waxes, wax wouldn't fall on them. And people, they just looked like a bunch of badasses, basically. And people were like, wow, those boys are a bunch of wide awakes. And basically from that moment on, uh, uh, the most effective movement for emancipation in American history, um, which is a far cry from being complete, <laughs> um, was launched. And by um, October, by this time, 160 years ago, by today, 160 years ago, there were hundreds of thousands of people marching in the streets with music, with songbooks, which I'd love to share with you. Um, problematic people, <laughs> uh, but um, singing, and, and, and rallying, a pep rally for freedom. And they reckon, and, and, that, and that was so inspiring to me that the Republican Party was founded 
1854 as a pro-abolition and pro-women suffrage party. Mm -hmm. And by 1860, they were a pro-immigration party. Mm -hmm. And they actually had a president in six years who was a moderate who chose to make an incredibly courageous decision for which he paid in his, he paid his life. Mm -hmm. And when that Messiah was killed, mm -hmm. um, so went the dreams of millions. So it was not for another 50 years that white women got the right to vote, not for another 100 years uh, that African-American women and others got the right to vote truly, and not for another 70 years that so many immigrants, especially Chinese Americans, would be getting given the rights that were demanded of them because the Republican Party was then co-opted um, by the, the powers that be who wanted to recreate the, the um, status quo and use slavery by another name in the form of mass incarceration. And uh, there, and so I've started looking at um, the, the suffragettes as, as, as wide awakes, looking at the uh, Marcus Garvey clearly asking us to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery as a wide awake, these people had awakenings. They were like uh, um, Siddhartha sitting under the, the the Bodhi tree. And when you have an awakening, you know the tear comes to your eyes. And some total strangers sent this to us, <laughs> and we're like, we can, we should just use this. Us being a bunch of other of us. And so all of a sudden, we had a, a bat symbol for finding our people. And though, and you know, and that's for those of us who want to be awake, which is a calling, not, it's not being woke where like, I got my badge, I'm good. It's like, I fail at being my, myself every day. And I have to pinch myself <laughs> to make sure that I'm awake so that I'm in the now, in the moment. The, and that's what I love about watching you play your instruments. That you're like, you're like literally wide awake. And, and I love that you channel the ancestors and so many others um, and, 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 and they vibrate through us through your work. So thank you. Uh, for that and, and so that's what i'm i'm on <laughs> but i really wanted to read my, sorry one thing that i really hope to do in my life which is write something or say something as powerful as um my favorite poem by uh, audrey lord and i only want to read uh the last uh stanzas of it which is called a litany for survival and she says um in this poem a litany for survival and when the sun rises, we are afraid it may not remain. And when the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. And when our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. And when our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. And when we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it's better to speak knowing we were never meant to survive. Well, you certainly are on the journey and on your way to do precisely that. Works. And thank you for like, you know, hipping me to all this cool stuff, Sarah, when I was having that with you. We have this like historical collaboration that seeds both of our work. I, I love it. I'm, um, I'm mindful of our time. I, I know we're going to open up for questions. And so those in the audience who have them, please prepare them and put them in the Q&A uh, chat, which, which I'll, I'll see in just a minute. But I, I do think it's important just to let us reflect maybe really briefly on how the pandemic in particular has impacted the urgency with which we see the collective practice of the arts. Um, so I would just ask really succinctly, has COVID, how has the pandemic altered how you see the urgency of your practice? And, and if so, how, um, as it relates to social change in particular? I mean, you work with Skid Row, BJ. I do. I, what, I'm, what I'm feeling moved to do, if, if it's okay with the panel, um, I'd love to respond musically. Um, if, if I could, because that is the most honest response that I have to the question, which is that I've been practicing more. <laughs> and and what, you, what you've been saying, what you just said, Hank, of, of failing, um, 
you know, I believe that artists have to chase failure, but we understand failure and therefore we understand forgiveness. We understand forgiveness and so therefore we understand failure. And so we're in this constant, this constant dialogue between forgiveness and failure, between constantly upgrading ourselves to that 2.0 that you're saying. And so we're, we're practicing evolution. And, and you know, the way that I see this reflected in, in, in the community in Skid Row is the invitation to show up is still there, right? There has always been an invitation to show up. But as we're showing up, we're showing up to these shards of ourselves in different ways. And the way that I show up is by playing. So. Um, I, I would actually love to hear if you know Hank or Hong An if you have any any thoughts and then I would would love to love to play something small. It could be after the questions as well. I'll just say really quickly. I would love to hear you play, but I'll just say really quickly that I I do think that yeah there there's a, an urgency because we cannot be physical right. We cannot be. I I can't be in my studio. I'm not filming anything. I can't really. I mean other people are finding ways, but I I can't at this point. Um, I embarked, I had a project that I was working on at the Wattis Institute that was supposed to be a live event that was going to be focused on Trinman, the work of Trinman Ha, um, who was an influential scholar and writer and, and filmmaker and artist of, um, who had a huge impact on my work. Um, and it turned into an online project, which is, it's and it's called We Listen Nearby. So it launches a website and it's really um, you know, kind of speaking to the to the point, the the number three um, rule that you said, Hank, which was just a, it, it's literally a space to create joy for for us. Um, it's conversations. I've kind of paired people that I know have a long history with each other, um, artists of color, starting right now with just um, Asian um, artists in the Asian diaspora, and really having conversations with each other over the phone. Um, which is something that to kind of avoid the video and just talking over the phone and really connecting with people over the phone and talking about shared legacies and shared intellectual histories and shared cultural histories and personal histories and political histories. And the idea is that people can listen in on these very intimate conversations and it's just hearing. And so it's over the phone and so you hear the crackle of the phone and the recording. And so it's a very intimate experience. So it's a way, it's kind of in a way like a very generous thing that I'm asking people you know, to do for us, which is to let us listen in on these very um, meaningful conversations about things that we might talk about with each other that I think are, that we need to share more often to create this space of joy and collective belonging. It's an important way to foreground the vulnerability that is really the cornerstone of the artistic process, right? That's great, yeah, in vulnerability, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, Hank, and, and I see we have well, we have a few questions in, in the chat. Um, if you might reflect on that, or or if you want to throw it to VJ to play, that's fine too. Okay, I knew that's what you were going to say. Okay, it's throwing it to you, VJ. Um, VJ, if you like to play now, that would be great. We have a few questions that will come after that. Wonderful. So I'd like to play a piece of music that's um, based on an ancient Hindustani raga called Charukeshi. Um, and it's been set to music by a composer named Rina Esmel, who also happens to be my wife. Um, and this is a piece that's based on a poem uh, from the 14th century Sufi poet Hafiz. And it goes like this. The poem is, when the violin can forgive the past, it starts singing. When the violin can stop worrying about the future, you will become such a drunk, laughing nuisance that God will then lean down and start combing you into her hair. When the violin can forgive every wound caused by others, the heart starts singing. <laughs>
Thank you. Oh, that's great. Well, we, we have a few questions in the chat. One has a distinctive character. I'm wondering about um, whether or not I'll ask it. I, I think we have time for each one. I think the first, the first one is squarely on the topic of um, cultural change and cultural institutions. There's a, a question that we're receiving here. I'll just read it from Maricha Cardone. Do you trust cultural institutions to make real change in terms of diversity and representation? Or do you feel that some of the changes will come from a, a different place, a place of guilt rather than deep understanding? So the question here is, is really reflecting on the transition uh, that we're seeing, uh, whether it's to do with representation in collections, boards, exhibition practices, uh, and are asking us to reflect on that. Maybe I'll, I'll pair that question with another related one and see if we'd like to tackle the themes in, in both. The other question is about, um, it states this, as we do collective work with our people and strive to make change, what does accountability look like in your efforts? So I, I think I'll pair those two and ask us to think about accountability. Are, are there ways that are accountability and maybe the challenge that comes from that uh, can advances your practice forward. Um, I, I think of this in the context of, in particular, your work hanged with four freedoms, because one of the organizing principles is to, is to engage with those who are not of the same mind as you, right? Uh, so I, I wonder about your thoughts on, on these two questions we have here. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, that it's so clear that BJ has found his people um, and that, you know, the only th song that came to mind while you were playing that was um, Ligas of Paris. <laughs> we ain't supposed to be here because <laughs> that's, that, 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 brought, that music was not meant for that instrument, you know? And when you decide to like take a, a classical European Western instrument, which is likely inspired by, you know, ancient immigrants from the continent of Asia where Europe is a small part, um, um, and, 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 and rip it. <laughs> I gotta just, I gotta shout that, that out because we also know about the, the origins uh, of, of East Indian music and also hip hop through the Caribbean, you know? So, so and that's also about taking um, what is not ours and making it and reclaiming it as our own. And so, um, that's how I address um, the the notion of an institution, you know, that we ain't supposed to be here, <laughs> you know, that when we show up, the 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 the, the actual molecular <laughs> structure of the of the of the institution changes forever, uh, because they know it and we know it, <laughs> you know, um, and as long as we're not afraid, um, I think we'll be okay. But when we're afraid of these buildings that aren't going to outlive us, likely, you know, much, um, us as a species, that's to say, um, then what are we really here for? You know, um, so I have uh, really been thinking a lot about June Jordan's poem, um, poem for South African women, where, of course, the iconic last line are, is we're the ones we've been waiting for. You know, so uh, do I trust institutions to do what they've been doing? Yes, I do. <laughs> and do I trust uh, the people who are um, in them to uh, either consciously or subconsciously chip away of the bricks <laughs> that have been keeping more, some of us out? Yes, because uh, again, there are no gatekeepers in the infinite game. And so um, I'm really excited about this moment. And one of my dear friends, Alexi Pesky, a French, a French Brazilian artist um, talked about how he's like, the door is open for the first time in 60 years. You know, he's like, it's, he, he said, it's only gonna be open for five minutes. He's like, we gotta bum rush the drawer and get as much done with as many people as possible before it closes again. And after I got on the phone with him, I was like, how come there are no door stops? <laughs> you know, like, wait, what if somebody just decides to hold the door? And I started thinking, of course, of Game of Thrones. <laughs> hold the door. <laughs> you know, we got to hold the door to reference some of you'll get maybe, in, uh, or maybe you won't. But this idea of, 
of um and so you know or maybe even <laughs> kick it open <laughs> not it, kick it down is something that i feel like we can do and because there's infinite space because in the in the land of of creativity there's nothing that we cannot achieve um, together when we are not trying to hold ourselves and others back through colonial method, method you know, thinking. Mm -hmm. Colonial, AKA finite thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, other thoughts, BJ or Hung An, regarding these two topics about accountability and cultural institutions? <laughs> I'll just share briefly, you know, um, I'm, I'm inspired by the work of, of uh, Peter Block, who wrote a series of books, one in particular, Community, the Structure of Belonging, and he describes accountability as the willingness to confront yourself with your own freedom. And I see that as a discipline, um, and a discipline where we literally apprentice ourselves to not knowing what the hell to do, right, and, and leaning into finding resonance, uh, finding resonance with our artistic practice. I mean, Jerry Seinfeld, I think, just wrote a book called Is This Anything, right? And I think we're always asking ourselves that question. I've worked, I've poured my heart into this. Is this anything? Won't you please receive this, right? And so I'm, I'm thinking about how, you know, there is this fragile boundary that we must walk where we're constantly cultivating an internal practice and we're seeking resonance in community, right? So the balance of personal aesthetic must be met in accountability to a community who holds up the mirror to you, right? And you're in constant conversation with that community. Um, and you know, uh, the way that, uh, there's another, another quote that's coming to mind, I think is Mother Teresa and she says, um, if you wanna pray, shut your mouth, shut your eyes and open your heart. Right. And so in that way, you know, art making is prayer. Right. Um, I think it's Kafka who said, like, art like prayer is a hand outstretched in the darkness, seeking for some touch of grace that will transform it into the hand that bestows gifts. Right. So we're praying. We're all just praying here. And however that registers with us, um, we have to close our eyes, close our mouths, but also open it, open the places that need to be opened in the way that find resonance in the world around us. So that's what I'll add to that. Um, I'll just I'll just add from like a very kind of maybe pragmatic point of view because I do teach in an institution and you know we've seen over the last months just like a, a, a kind of explosion of these accountability processes for art institutions. And um, I think that the questions are really important um, because it, it's, it's, it's a long, hard road, and it's not just about changing, it's not just representational politics at play, right? Um, and I, I just think of one, I think of one example that is really inspiring, which is the Yale Union in Portland, Oregon, which just basically repatriated its building and its land over to the native, uh, a native tribe that on, on which the building sits. Um, they went through a years long process um, and it, it's quite phenomenal. And they literally gave the building over. Um, and so I think that when I think about deco de decolonization, you know, I think about the, um, the article by um, um, Yang and Tuck, who, you know, say it's not a metaphor. It's actual. It's literal. Like, we can do this, you know, that these processes are not just metaphorical. And it, it takes long hard work. Um, and I think that this happens on very minute levels every day in the work that we do with the people in the educational institutions that we work in and the art institutions that we engage with. Um, so I think those accountability processes are long. And I think they they to engage them is to, you know, be in that long struggle to help to, to kind of move people through these processes and get and kind of meet people where they're at but but move forward. Yes. Yes, I know they're asking us to, to wrap. Um, I don't want us to have to. I think that where we've arrived, even with that, that comment, sort of speaks to, well, first, what is emerging in the Q&A, uh, and, and that is a reflection and an appreciation for the comments that art is a, is a verb and uh, rather sorry that art is a verb rather than a noun and how powerful that is this this audience member uh lynn rice is 
just thanking us for acknowledging art as a process uh, and not a resulting commodity to be consumed, right? So I think this, <laughs> they're saying, please don't end. I know we don't want to end. Um, but this, this speaks so much to, I think, why it was powerful to begin and to frame the conversation with the uh, sort of wishes of Frederick Douglass stated in this redrafted speech, you know, four times over the course of his life, pictures in progress. He was not saluting the mastery of a particular artwork or piece of music. He was enchanted with the possibility of, of how the imagination could be shifted by the power of the arts, how it could create a, a productive criticality for us to better envision ourselves anew. So the stakes of the work, he deeply understood. The role of a representational democracy requires us to take seriously representation itself, by which we mean culture, how it is that we show ourselves to ourselves. And that is that is the, the stream, the journey, the the, and when you're speaking about the ancestors, the ancestors that we're calling upon, that is the, the collective work that you, VA, Hank, and Hung An are, are engaged in. And it is, it is a profound practice, and it is such an honor to be able to speak with you all about your work, your, your sadhana, your creative practice. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Hung An, for, um, you know, being so brilliant and so courageous and teaching me to read while also making art. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is super, yeah, super it's inspiring. And yeah, I've learned so much from all of you over the years. So it's, um, it's really an honor. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Cutie. Thank you.